So I've been working with the um, swag ink a little bit, and I found something very curious, that whenever I change the formulation of the swag ink, its generation properties actually get worse, which is kind of cool in one way, because it means that almost by accident, I've stumbled on this formula that will generate electricity, and I kind of can't believe that in a way, and in another way, however I play with it, it's getting worse, so it must be luck, and that's astounding. It shows you really that if you're playing with these things, you never know what you're going to come across. You never know what you're going to find, and it's just the act of looking that will very often lead to something. So when people say, what are you doing, and why are you doing this, and where's your specific direction? Sometimes you just don't need one because you're going to stumble over something. So a lot of the times, just play with it. Have a go and see what you come up with. And it's amazing what people come up with. Obviously, they write to me and show me some of the things they're coming up with, and I just sit there thinking, wow, that's incredible. Anyway, this is about um, implementing the swag generator because having discovered that, I'm actually just going to leave the ink alone. I was playing with it. I was talking to my wife um, last night, and she was saying, well, look, you've got something that works. Why don't you just see if you can build something out of it? You build it, they'll come. And I thought, yeah, actually, she's right. Yeah, 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 let's stop playing with it. Let's actually build a prototype. Now, I had a lot of input on prototypes from people. What kind of setup they think would be a good setup? And I've taken those on board and had to think about them. Now, quite a popular one, and <laughs> this is an odd one, actually. So there's a lot of people are saying, paint the bottom of a boat with it. And I guess you could, because, you know, in the bottom of a boat, it moves through the water all by itself. If it's a sailboat, it's going to generate electricity. Cool. Um, but it's kind of restrictive in a way, in that you have to have a boat, and you've got your electricity on your boat, but you're not going to be able to get it to, to land, and only those people who are near the sea can use it. So I find it a bit restrictive, so not something I'm actually going to um, pursue very much. Because I think that what we really need is a unit that you can um, put into the sea, and just have it generate for you. Now, I'm a huge fan of microgeneration, that is generating the power that you need at the site at which you apply it, and, and I think that's great, and um, I live by the sea so I can do that, lots of people who talk to me live by the sea so they can do that, but lots of people don't. So what that's going to mean is we're going to need to devise some kind of system that's scalable. So we can do little ones if you want to generate for your own house, but we can do big ones for centralised distribution. Now, as I say, I'm not a fan of centralised distribution, but sometimes it's the only way you can go. So we're looking at some kind of system that is scalable, can either be small or big, can be put into the grid and can be distributed to everybody, as well as form a microgeneration system so you can just build one yourself and generate your own electricity at home. So the system has to have those kind of qualities to it. Now, I've had a number of suggestions on mechanical systems involving power, and they're very interesting. Um, there's two that I want to talk about. The first one, uh, it's been a popular one, is the Tesla turbine. Now, we all know what a Tesla turbine looks like. It's essentially a row of discs on an axle. You force in a fluid at a tangent. The fluid goes around in that direction and exits through the central axle port. And the motion of the fluid spins the discs. Now, Tesla turbines spin at phenomenal speeds. They spin at hundreds, um, sorry, tens of thousands of revolutions per minute. So they spin very, very quickly. The other thing you can do with them is if you attach a motor to your axle and you turn the motor, then the reverse will happen. It will actually pump fluid through it. And this has been the idea. People said, stick some salt water, stick a motor on, pump the fluid through it, and you'll get electricity generation across those discs. As long as those discs have that same format that we've looked at, so the disc would have a central conducting section, an edge conducting section, and then our graphene ink coat in between the two of them. Because from the experiments that I've done, if the metal coat is continuous with the graphene on top, it doesn't work. And that makes sense if you think about it, because the whole thing works by being able to separate the charge distribution. If you have a continuous conductor underneath the graphene ink, there's no charge separation, and so it doesn't generate, because there's no way for it to do that. So there must be a separation between the edge collectors, the uh, current collectors, and an area that has no conduction, so that you can get that uh, charge distribution separation going on. Anyway, so the disc would have to be coated like this, and then what you would do is attach your motor, connect up your collector here, and collector here, and that's where you would get your voltage from. 
And this looks very similar to me to the homopolar motor, uh, generator. Now the homopolar generator is another really interesting device. It is essentially a big old copper disc. And if you put a magnetic field across that disc, incidentally that field can either be static or moving with the disc, it doesn't make a difference, and that's very curious. But if you put a magnetic field across that disc and then spin it, you'll get generation. Now, it's a high current DC voltage that's generated and it's collected in the same way that the um, Tesla fans are saying. We collect it from the edge contact and the central axle contact. Uh, this incidentally is very similar to the um, end motor as well that's been uh, proposed. But there's a, a quite a significant problem with that. In order to get the generation, you have to spin this very quickly. When you spin this very quickly, then this edge contact is next to impossible to maintain properly. It bounces, and when it bounces, it loses contact. What they did originally was they made that go through a bath of mercury, because the mercury is always in constant contact with the edge. And of course, we don't like to use mercury because it's um, very, very poisonous. I suppose you could use gadolinium if you wanted, uh, or a gadolinium indium. Um, alloy, which would have a low melting point temperature, say below room temperature, something like that as an alternative, but edge contact is a serious problem with this kind of design. Now, that's not something that escaped Tesla, of course, because Tesla's a bit of a genius, bless his heart, um, and he looked at the homopolar generator, uh, and what he came up with was two discs, and you connected those discs by a flexible metal belt. So when you rotated one of them, it would rotate the other one in the correct direction that the voltage could actually just be pulled off at the two axles. And of course, that is a significant improvement because it reduces the engineering challenge right down. So we could implement a very similar system to the Tesla turbine system that was suggested in that the turbine blades, there would be two of them connected by a flexible material that conducted, and we could pull the voltage off from the central axle. So that's a very interesting idea. Now, there is a slight problem with that as far as I'm concerned, in that in order to do that, you need a motor. Now, if you put a motor onto anything that you want to generate from, you're already going to enter a whole world of pain. Because what you need to prove is net power output. That is, that the net power output is greater than the power input. And that can be very difficult to prove. And the minute you start going into those kind of proofs and calculations, you are going to get a whole host of people saying, that can't possibly work, you've forgotten this, you haven't taken that into account, you haven't put this forward. And really, you could spend the rest of your life <laughs> arguing with those kind of people about this kind of setup. And it's not something I really want to do, and it's something that I want to shy away from and um, not get involved in. So the motor attachment is the real killer for this idea, for me personally. I don't think it's a bad idea, I think it's an excellent idea. It's just because of the motor attachment, then I'm really not going to look at that as a first implementation. I just don't like it because I don't want to get involved with those people, those people who are going to argue that it can't possibly work. Now equally, there have been other suggestions involving motorisation including having a, a tube or a wheel that serves that kind of cross-section, the fluid inside, spinning the wheel and you'll get power out. Well, yes, you probably would. But again, you've got the motor involvement, and once you get the motor involvement, I kind of switch off. Um, really because what I'm looking for is a passive system. That is a system with no moving parts, where the um, fluid flow is literally from the external environment. That is the rush of the sea, and it just sits there having the sea push over it, generating power, that kind of thing. You don't really get yourself involved in it. As long as the damn thing generates power, you're going to be able to say, told you so. Now, we do know that if we take our sheet of A4 and connect up our current collectors, paint that in there, then depending on wave conditions, we'll get somewhere between 8 to 2 milliamps. That's pretty poor. That's pretty bad. But what we need to do, obviously, is improve the power output. And the simplest way of improving the power output is just to stack these things up. So if we point, paint both sides of it, and then have a 500 of those, we're going to get somewhere, depending on sea conditions, between 8 to 2 amps all day, every day. 
That's cool. Now, a thousand sheets sounds like a lot of sheets. But like I said, pin both sides and it's 500. That still sounds like a lot of sheets. But that's a ream of paper. There's 500 sheets of paper in that. And of course, our ink won't increase the thickness of that by very much. We need to separate it so that the fluid can flow in between it, but the separation that we need is not going to be significant. So we're going to end up with a um, unit that's about that size, and say about that thick, probably, and that unit is going to generate between 8 and 2 amps all day long, every single day. The only thing that we need to be able to do with that is wash the sea over it. So if we set up a situation where we have a box with 500 of our sheets set in there, so the sheets poke up a little bit, connect a connect, uh, current collector to the top and bottom, and allow the sea to wash up and down on that, then we're going to have the unit that we're looking for. Now, in order to get that to happen, all we actually have to do is stick a pipe in the sea. If we put a pipe in the sea that narrows with the weight of the water that's pour forced in there, the distance of travel is going to be quite easy to control. I mean, a lot of people um, live by areas where the distance of traveling is in the order of 5, 10, 20 meters. So you're not going to have this kind of problem. Uh, as you see, I've got to live on quite a shallow beach. So the up and down is quite a lot, but it doesn't have um, a really significant look to it when you're sitting there. This kind of thing would allow you to concentrate that so that you would put this box in here and have that wave travel up and down washing over those plates and that would generate you somewhere between 8 to 2 amps every day, all day long with a unit about the size of a ream of paper. So in terms of prototyping something, that's probably what I'm going to go for is this sort of gill-like structure. And that's what actually struck me, it was a bit like a fish gill. So we create this gill-like structure, stick it in a pipe, we should be able to generate a significant amount of power without actually having to put any power in. I mean, obviously we are putting power in, we're putting power in from the power of the sea, but we don't actually have to turn a motor to do anything, so we don't have to get ourselves involved in those net power output calculations. All we do is stick it in the sea, take some readings, and say, hey, look, we've got a seawater generator. So that's what I'm going to be building over the next few days, weeks. Anyway, I hope that was of interest to you, and thank you very much for watching.